I'm Marty Seligman, and I've been the impresario of Medici II, the cheerleader, the glue. In about 1450, uh, Cosimo the Great had uh, uh, acquired enormous riches, first from the wool trade and then from banking and politics. And uh, he devoted his resources and the resources of Florence not to military buildup, but rather to the question of what is beautiful. And uh, Cosimo the Great gathered together in the last half of the 14th century, sorry, the 15th century, some of the greatest artists, sculptors, poets, mathematicians, and scientists invited them to his home, and what happened was the Renaissance, the High Renaissance. Medici, too, is named in his honor. There was one other precedent for Medici, too, and I'd call it Copenhagen I. Uh, in the first years of uh, this century, uh, Niels Bohr in Copenhagen and a large number of physicists sat around and drank coffee and beer together. And out of these brilliant minds sitting around and drinking beer together came the theory of the atom. That's our second model. So Medici II has been an attempt to bring the leading senior, junior, and graduate fellows from all over the world in the field of positive psychology together to drink beer, to converse, to have coffee, and what's been the result? Well, first, we didn't think that such a uh, gathering would work unless there were concrete research issues around which these 30 terrific people would converse. And so we chose five different domains. The first domain is the, what I call hardening the dependent variable, or what is the effect of your quality of life on the positive side of life, on how long you live, on your physical health, and on your productivity at work. So in Project 1, what we've done is designed a battery of questions that ask about your positive emotion, how much engagement you have in work, how much meaning and purpose you have in life. And we've joined together with the military, various corporations, healthcare organizations, teaching organizations, to ask in these different settings if in year one of this project we measure all your workers' positive emotion, engagement, and meaning. To what extent do those good things in life predict who's going to be most productive at work by your definition? In a corporation, of course, it's different than in a school. Uh, and who's going to be most physically healthy? And then in year two, we will use for a random subsample of your workers the reflective happiness exercises that you've been taking over the last few months to see if increasing people's positive emotion, engagement, and meaning increases their productivity and their physical health. So that's project one around which beer was drunk and conversation was had and a lot of coffee was drunk. Uh, project two is national well-being indicators. At the time of the Industrial Revolution, and when, when nations are poor, how much money they make is a good first approximation to how well a nation is doing. But when nations become wealthy, economic like indicators alone, like gross national product, become very badly skewed. So while our gross domestic product our economic indicators continue to rise and rise and rise. We have an unprecedented amount of depression, huge crime rate, a health care system that's falling apart, and a, a massive discontent and lack of trust among our people. So the second project is an attempt to create politically neutral measures of well-being and to marry those with economic indicators to produce a more accurate picture of how a nation is doing. 
our corporation is doing. The third project around which Medici II has been coffeed and beard and conversed is spirituality and living well. That is the extent to which spirituality is a bulwark of the good life. And so we've been wrapped up in questions of distinguishing spirituality from religion and asking the question uh, how these two separable positive notions influence human life uh, at every stage of development. The fourth project is psychological capital. Psychological capital is the notion that when we are faced with a challenge, as we go through education, as we go through uh, the difficult phases of life, sometimes psychological capital is laid down that we can draw on later in life. Sometimes we build what we are, and other times we do not. So psychological capital project is asking under what conditions of attention, under what conditions of flow, under what conditions of positive emotion do we lay down psychological investments for the future that make us better able in the future uh, to carry out our main life goals. And the final project is uh, websites like reflectivehappiness.com, like authentichappiness.org, in every major language. So this year we brought in our colleagues from Hong Kong and Madrid, and we began to translate and back-translate all the questionnaires that you've taken into Chinese and into Spanish. And over the next three years, we will build complete Spanish and Chinese websites that will cover almost half the world's population as far as sampling goes. And then in the years following, we intend to create positive psychology websites in every major language group. Finally, I want to talk about the future. Because we had these brilliant minds together, we devoted two afternoons a week to asking what are the truly great questions beyond the three years of Medici that positive psychology should be concerned with. We call these flagship projects, and I'll tell you where we are about flagship projects at the moment. The first one we agreed about was positive human futures. So much of utopian and dystopian thinking assumes that the world is going to fall apart and that utopias don't work. And indeed, the world may fall apart, and we may become a Bosnia. But if the past is any guide, things have been getting better and better for a long time in the wealthy nations with disruptions like wars and depression. But the general envelope has been a balky upward trend. What if things continue to go upward? What would government look like? What would religion look like? Are there spiritual technologies? What can we do to uh, keep the islands of positivity going? How can you spread a positive human future to a population of 10 billion? These are the great questions that the Positive Human Future Project may ask. A second project is the absolute versus the relative. In the 20th century, the great minds relativize the absolute. It's very interesting that Pope Benedict XVI has told us in his opening speeches that relativism is the great enemy. Well, I don't know whether or not that's so, but it's not just theology in which the absolute versus the relative is a raging argument, but in science. There are people who are Kuhnians and believe that science is after paradigms and fashion. There are people who are realists and believe scientists are discovering the truth. In mathematics, there are uh, Platonists like Gödel and Einstein who believe they were discovering rock-bottom facts about what was true in mathematics. Whereas in mathematics and physics, there are people who believe that man is the measure of all things and that truth is relative. Within uh, the question of where are great human accomplishments produced, Charles Murray has argued they occur in societies that believe in absolute truth, beauty, and goodness. In child rearing, we don't know whether or not children reared relativistically or with absolutism or in between authoritative parenting do best. So a second flagship project 
is to take the ten or so areas in which the absolute versus the relative is a fiery controversy to bring the people together on both sides, not to attempt to resolve this. I don't think these two sides are going to come together, but rather to see if there are common issues among these different forms of absolutism and relativism and to try to lay out the debate. If Pope Benedict is right, it may be the geniuses of the 21st century will relativize the absolute. The third great project is our own longitudinal study of uh, people across their lives. There are a very large number of longitudinal studies that follow people from birth uh, through adolescence, through middle age, and into death. But almost all these studies only ask about the negative side of life, about what's wrong. To the extent we want to make people happier, we need our own longitudinal study in which we ask questions about meaning, the development of character, the development of positive emotion. And so a third great project we want to launch is a longitudinal study of what makes life worth living. And a fourth project is alternative to the tragic sense of life. What counts as good literature, what counts as high poetry and high drama is universally tragedy. That is tragedy in the sense that heroism, virtue, meaning are hubris. They fail. They come to an end. That's the essence of tragedy. That's the uh, literature that all of you were raised with. That's the literature that's taught in the canon in high school and in college, Death of the Salesman, Macbeth, Hamlet, and the like. Is there an alternative to the tragic sense of life? Could the massive increase in depression that this nation suffers and our young people suffer be due to an unbroken exposure to the tragic sense of life? Is there an alternative in which we recognize the role of tragedy in life, but we also believe that heroism, virtue, and character are to be emulated, are noble, are the goals of human existence? It's going to be your privilege to meet the great minds from positive psychology. So we're going to bring to reflectivehappiness.com the experts in positive psychology to tell you what happened to them in Medici too and where they're going with their very best ideas for the human future.